Okay. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, no, hi to everybody. Uh, so uh, this is the, the last lecture today. And um, if I uh, just uh, try to uh, see uh, what we have been doing so far. So just this small recap now to, uh, we started with the uh, basic uh, stuff from basic introduction to randometrics theory. Um, which has served uh, as a background, I mean, I think for many things and objects that uh, we have encountered uh, in this course, in these lectures. Uh, then I discussed uh, this, I went to discuss these uh, fermions and their connections to random matrix uh, theory. And in particular, we have also unveiled the nice connections with the Carter Paris Zizang equations, which is somehow lurking around this, uh, uh, this, uh, these models here. And um, the other day, I mean, uh, yesterday actually, uh, I introduced a uh, kind of third, uh, uh, third object or third family of uh, models and interesting models, which are related to the two others, which are this non-intersecting path. And that will be uh, the, the, the topic of today. And uh, the idea is to, okay, uh, try to show you the connection to or present you what is known under the name of Dyson's Banyan motion. So that's, that's the goal uh, of today. Um, so let me just uh, start with this uh, first, uh, I mean, this is where, what we started with yesterday uh, when I introduced this, um, this object. So basically um, this is what, uh, we will, the, the basic object that we will have in mind today are these, the trajectories of Brownian motions, okay? So uh, this is the way I define this Brownian motion here. X dot is just, so velocity is just uh, white noise. And in fact, in the following, I will usually set D equal half such that this 2D is just equal to one, but um, okay. And um, so this is just a realization of, uh, of a Brownian motion. And sometimes I would like to call it, a, I mean, a bridge in the sense that uh, this Brownian motion is pinned both at the origin and at the final time, okay? So T is fixed in, the, in what we will say below. The, the time interval is fixed. And I basically uh, fix uh, the initial point and the final point, A and B. And so this is one single Brownian motion. And what I want to study, of course, is kind of interacting model, if you want, of Brownian motions in a sort of uh, interesting way. Uh, and the interaction, if you want, is uh, extremely short range in the sense that uh, the, 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 um, the only con constraint that this Brownian path have is that it cannot, they cannot intersect. Okay, so that's typically one uh, trajectory here of this non-intersecting uh, Brownian motion. And um, this is what we will be studying today. So as I uh, discussed or mentioned briefly uh, it yesterday, this is sometimes called vicious walkers. And I will probably quite often use this, uh, this term here. And basically what we would like to understand, so typically I will use this also this notation uh, capital N to define uh, the total number of uh, non-intersecting paths. And in this case, n is just equal to three. So uh, the, the basic, uh, the, the, I mean, the object that uh, we would like to, to understand and um, as for any uh, stochastic process, I mean, at least the building block um, is basically the transition probability. Okay, so that, that will be our goal. So what we would like uh, to, to understand is what I will denote by this capital P T, uh, which will be a function of this, I will denote it this way. A to B, uh, with A being a vector in this case, which is just say A1, A2, AN. So these are the the, depart, the, the the starting points. And the Bs are just the B1, B2, BN. And this PT is basically the transition probability 
density from A to B. within time t, okay? So what's the probability, if you want, uh, that I arrive at B1, B2, Bn at time capital T, given that I started from these initial points A1, A2, An, and given, of course, in addition, the constraint that these guys do not cross. Okay, so of course, what is difficult to, to, to have it here uh, is the uh, is the transition? I mean, is, is how to incorporate this non-crossing, non-intersecting condition? Okay, so let's just try to uh, maybe uh, the, the 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 there is at least one guy that we know how to compute is the case basically when uh, when n is equal to one. So when n equal one, I mean, of course, uh, the problem is very simple because uh, uh, okay, this P T capital T. Now I just have A and B. And this is what I will denote small p. Okay, so A and B here are just real. And of course, in this case, uh, you know uh, that this is just, so I have, okay, I will, I will just use D equal half from now on. So usually this is uh, four pi DT. So here it will be just, one over two pi t, square root of two pi t, exponential of minus b minus a squared, uh, divided by two t. Okay, so that's, uh, of course, uh, very well known. And essentially, uh, the question is, uh, what happens uh, for n bigger than one? So, uh, I will start uh, by presenting a uh, kind of, uh, I mean, the, the standard way to do that uh, in this context uh, and in the context of stochastic processes. Uh, and uh, this is called under the name of the Karlin McGregor formula. So I would like to, um, to discuss this uh, with you. So I will not really prove it, but I will just try to give you the idea of this formula. So let's try to understand this Karlin McGregor formula uh, on the simplest case, uh, n equals two. So what I will do is that I will consider all the trajectories that connect A, A's uh, to B's uh, within the time T. And I will divide the, the set of these trajectories into two subsets. So I will divide uh, the sets of trajectories from A to B uh, within the interval zero T, which could be set equals to one, I mean, if you want, um, into two subsets. Uh, which I will call A and B. And which are disjoint. You will see. And uh, let's divide all these trajectories into sets. So A actually, the set A is the one that we are after. The set A are precisely the sets of trajectories that do not cross each other. Okay, so I start, this one starts from A1 and arrives at B1 and the other blue one starts at A2 and arrives at B2, but the point is that here there is no crossing. So this is my set A. And the other set B is the set of trajectories 
where the black and blue trajectories cross each other at least once. In fact, if they cross once, then they will need to cross twice. But typically, uh, I would get so I would get, I would have my a one here. So this one would do that from a one to b one, and the blue one starts from a two and arrive at b two. But now the main difference is that they actually uh, cross each other at least two times. Okay. So now, of course, uh, if I take A plus B or A union B, I will generate uh, all the, 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 the trajectories that connect A from B, but including, uh, including crossings. Instead of that, I would like to get rid of these guys. Okay, so I would like to uh, just keep these A's because these are the ones that I would like to keep. Now, the trick uh, that was uh, proposed by Carlin and McGregor is a kind of generalization of the so-called reflection principle uh, that you have maybe encountered uh, when you study a single Brownian motion in the presence of an absorbing boundary. And here, uh, it works as follows. So the idea is to look at the first, uh, the first crossing Say this one. And what you will do here is to permute the two particles. So what you will do here, you permute the two particles. So what does it mean? Well, it means that basically the so at this point, basically the, the this trajectory actually becomes a blue one. Okay. And the other one becomes black. Okay. So now if you look at the trajectories that you get, well, you have now a new set of trajectories. But what you see is that it's simply that now this one is a trajectory where now A1, so you start from A1 and you arrive at B2, while the blue one starts from A2 and arrives at B1. So that means that this kind of configuration that you have generated. So basically, that means that you are trying to establish a mapping between the trajectories that cross each other at least each time. So the point is that these kind of trajectories, they contribute to trajectories where the first, uh, so the, 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 the first particles, say x1, which is the blue one, goes from A2 to B1, and the black particles, say X2, goes instead from A1 to B2. OK. Now, what you can show is that, uh, so I, I showed you that if I have such a trajectory where I, I have at least one crossing, then I have generated such a configuration. You can actually show that starting from such a configuration, you can also generate a configuration where at least I have two crossings. So in other words, what I'm trying to say here is that if I want to get rid of these B types of trajectories, because I want only the ones where I don't have any crossing, well, what I actually have to count is just the number of 
trajectories, or say the propagator, if you want, or the probability density, where I start from A1, A2, and I arrive at B1, B2. And that's, uh, that's the, 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 the essence of the uh, Carlin McGregor uh, in this case. So let, let's write now uh, mathematically what I tried to, uh, to, to show you here, graphically, is that in this case, so if you want to compute this probability, starting say from A1, A2 to B1, B2, well, if I just do that, so that means that I will first consider all the, uh, I will first include all the trajectories that starts from A1, A2 arriving at B1, B2, but without the constraint. So that is just the PT single particle A1 to B1 times PT from A2 to B2. But now I need to subtract these trajectories and these trajectories are actually what is the, the associated propagator, or what is, if you want, the way to count how many of them are there. This is just the propagator from this time, starting from A1 arriving at B2 times this, the same propagator of a single particle, starting from A2 and arriving at B1. So well, that's just, again, uh, I pretend that this is a generalization of the, uh, of the reflection of the reflection principle. But there is slightly more than that, because you can actually see that if you look at this formula, well, you can actually write it as a two by two determinant. And this is just the determinant of the following matrix where you have PT, A1, B1. The other term on the diagonal is just A2 to B2. And then the off diagonal term, you, you guess what it is, is just PT from A1 to B2. And here, this is the PT of A2 to be one. Okay. So that's nice. I mean, because we sort of recover this kind of determinant and we have seen that this determinantal structure actually have been uh, lurking around many of our uh, models here, either uh, matrices with this Van der Mond determinant or with fermions. And we will see how actually we can also, in a minute, we will see how we can understand uh, this calculation here in terms of, in terms of, of, uh, of fermions, but uh, this is the result for two particles, and uh, I will not show it, but uh, it's slightly more complicated. But for n particles, uh, you can just you, you just have uh, a generalization of that, which is the the Carlin McGregor uh, result. That more generally, this propagator is just a, a n by n determinant that you can construct from the single particle. So what is quite nice is that, so again, what is nice is that you only need to know the, you only need to know the, uh, the propagator of a single particle here. Okay, so again, uh, that's really the, the, the nice thing here, no? is that this is really the single particle propagator or probability density or, I mean, or sorry, transition probability or whatever, uh, call it as you want. So that's the, the, the formula uh, that was derived by uh, Carlin and McGregor in 59, so it, it's, quite, it's quite old. Uh, so this is called the map, the Carlin McGregor formula. So 
So it's quite nice now because uh, in principle, it's rather simple. Now, of course, we know that manipulating determinants is always a bit tricky. Um, but uh, again, uh, you have a very nice starting point. Now, I just want to, to quote it explicitly, you know, that uh, it can be understood really as a, as a generalization of the so-called reflection principle. Okay, so I've been deriving this formula here. I wrote it, uh, if you want, um, for continuous time processes, Markov processes. It can also be written more generally for discrete time uh, random walks. And in this case, this is, this is sometimes called the Lindstrom, Lindstrom, Gessel, Vieno formula, uh, and which can also be generalized on any graph. And uh, it's it's quite quite robust formula actually. But today I will mainly uh, mainly mainly study this uh, this guy. Hi, uh, some quick question. Uh, so uh, this formula you sort of the one for the two particle case you wrote down. Yeah. It looks like uh, it only accounts for one intersection or like uh, it can have multiple intersections during the sozone. Yeah, yeah. So in fact, yeah, so you can convince yourself, okay, this requires a little bit of work, but uh, indeed, uh, so here I just had, uh, the important is that you just need to, um, uh, you just need to, so if you have multiple intersections, I mean, you just need to go back to the first point where they, where they did interact and you can just reproduce the same, uh, the same argument. Okay, graphically, uh, I will not do it because it's a bit, uh, uh, but but if you have many, I mean, a larger number of crossing, uh, you can you can still do it. Yeah. So the, just 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 imagine. Oh, does that mean that in uh, so this PT should be thought of as like some short time propagator where only you have one crossing, and then when you compose uh, uh, for the larger time trajectories, so you have to multiply these determinants. And... Yeah, that's one way to think about it. Yes. Okay. Thanks. That means also, I mean. Uh, because what you said, uh, that also means that this type of argument, of course, assumes that uh, I have a Markov property, right? That essentially everything that happens uh, below the, I mean, before before the crossing and after the crossing are completely independent. And this is, of course, only true for Markov processes, and which which is the case, of course, of Banyan motion. But what, what I want to say is that uh, this Karin Mangregor formula would not work for a non-Markov process, right? Okay, okay, thanks. Okay, so it's uh, nice. Oh, please. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so for this two by two case, is it obvious that the probability is normalized? No, so uh, actually, yes, that's a good question. In fact, it's not normalized. Okay, so that, that I, I wanted to say, but I forgot. Um, it's not normalized in the sense that, um, yeah, I should have said it before. Um, <clears throat> maybe uh, it's a remark that I could do here. So if you integrate over B here at this stage, so if you integrate over all possible values of Bs, ordered values of Bs, uh, what you get is actually is the, the non-crossing probability. So that's the probability that the vicious walkers or the walkers, if you want, do not intersect up to time T. So, so it's, not, it's not normalized, in fact. This one is. Okay, when you integrate over B, indeed, this, this is one. But uh, this one is not. Okay. Oh, like uh, it shouldn't it be normalized? I thought it should have been normalized. No, no, it's, no, it, it's not normalized actually. Again, it's uh, again, it's not normalized. Uh, this probability, I mean, the way that 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 is defined here. Uh, is such that again the, the integral over b you can normalize it okay but uh, the integral over b gives you the probability that these uh, walkers do not intersect okay up to time t okay 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 it's it's really because uh, this is a transition probability here uh, but where you only count the paths that do not cross each other okay so in that sense it's not it's not it's not a conditional, uh, it's not a condition process here. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. Thank yeah, you. One, one can also probably think of it like a Slater determinant. Yes, exactly. So that, that's what I want to explain now. Ah, is okay. the, indeed, yes, precisely, yeah. So what I want to explain is that uh, one, can, one can indeed understand, understand this 
there is a determinant. Uh, there is a kind of non-crossing, non-crossing uh, um, condition, and we would like to see something that looks like fermions uh, behind. And uh, indeed, one can understand this in terms of uh, in terms of Slater determinants. I'll come to that right now, actually. So before I just answer the question of Jean-François, um, is there a generalization of the Carlin McGregor formula if the paths are constrained to remain in a closed domain? Uh, yes, yes, uh, indeed. Uh, if um, if your process remains uh, remain Markovian, uh, then 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 this formula is still valid. So, for instance, if you I don't know, I mean, uh, if you if you look at this. Um, yeah, you can just um, constrain uh, your, your Brownian motion to stay within a box between zero and L, for instance. Uh, well, then this formula is still valid. And the, the, pro the propagator that you have to put here, of course, is then the, the constraint propagator. But yes, so it's, it's, it's a quite, uh, it's, it's a very nice formula, actually. It's a very, very, uh, uh, very robust. Uh, uh, of course, you really need to have this Markov property, uh, but, uh, but you can indeed, uh, you can use it in various contexts. Okay. So now what I want to, to, to show you is that uh, I would like to, uh, um, to give you a fermionic approach uh, to Carlin McGregor formula. Uh, so that's, that will be my second point and we will see how this, how this uh, state or determinant actually uh, coming. Okay, so that's the second part. Uh, that, that is Carlin McGregor. If you look at the paper by, Cal, by Carlin and McGregor, actually, it's, uh, it's a quite technical paper. It's a, this is a math paper. And it's a bit, bit hard to read, but I want to provide here uh, a relatively simple derivation. I mean, okay. Derivation of this formula via fermions. So I need first to introduce a little bit of path integral formulation uh, because otherwise uh, I won't be able really to, to, to show it uh, properly. Um, so I will just uh, we just start first with a crash course on path integral. I mean, okay, I will just need some very basic stuff. So path integral uh, for one Brownian motion. So again, uh, what I uh, use it here, okay, so I have this picture, very, very simple. Uh, so I have a Brownian motion. that start at A, arrive at B, in a given time T. So this is T, this is zero, and uh, okay, this should be tau instead. Okay, so I have uh, my process, which is just d tau x tau is just z tau of tau. Okay, and I have I have a bridge if you want, in the sense that I have x of zero is equal to a, and x of b, sorry, x of t, which is b. And I want to uh, write this. Uh, I would like so z tau of tau is a, is a Gaussian right now, as usual. Okay. Now, what I would like to write is really the probability, and the weight associated to this, the probability weight associated to this path, okay, to this trajectory. Okay, so I would like to write uh, something, and that's, I would like to write, if you want, the, prob the probability of a given So that means that I have, in principle, to define a probability measure on the space of path, etc. I mean, okay, I will not enter into these details. I mean, also as a mathematician, as physicists, sorry, uh, we do not care too, too much about that. Uh, but uh, 
what I would like to write is really the probability associated to that. Now, what we know, because this guy is just is just a white noise, we know that I can just write it as exponential of minus half of the integral of x dot tau squared from zero to t. And then I have two delta functions that ensures the initial and final position. Okay. So how do I know that this is exponential of minus half x dot square? Well, I know that because uh, x dot is precisely equal to zeta of tau because of this equation of motion. And zeta of tau is, is a Gaussian white noise. Okay. So then I will, I just have to compute the Jacobian uh, from uh, going to a uh, to d tau, to, sorry, to, to x of tau to, to d tau of tau, but okay. Uh, at the end of the day, this is what I get. Now, why is it interesting? So that means that um, it, it is interesting because with that, I can in principle uh, compute the, uh, the probability, the transition probability, okay? So that means that to compute the transition probability, uh, I will need to, to, to sum over all the path that connects uh, that connects uh, A to B in, in the interval zero T. So I can just write it, uh, I can write a kind of formal formula if you want as a path interval, okay? So that means that PT of AB uh, is just equal uh, to, okay. So So I integrate over all the path in this way, exponential of minus half, integral from zero to t, d tau, x dot of tau squared, and Okay, so that's what uh, that's what uh, I want to evaluate. Now, if you look at it, and if you remember, if you if you know a little bit of uh, path integral for, for for quantum mechanics, well, you can you can easily see uh, recognize that this is just the path integral uh, in imaginary time uh, of a free quantum particle. Okay, so that's this thing is actually. The path integral in imaginary time for a free quantum particle. So free means uh, with uh, Hamiltonian. Uh, we call just small h, which is just minus half d2 dx squared. So what I what I want to say by that is that this is just uh, it's another way if you want of writing this propagator now, but in the language of quantum mechanics, so that's just the propagator. So that means that this is just exponential of minus th, sorry, th hat, but now it's sandwiched, so you started at A and you arrive at B. Okay. This is in imaginary time, uh, because here you see, I mean, in, in quantum mechanics, I should have an I, okay? Uh, so I, that means that I have, I have done what is called the Vic rotation, if you want. But what is quite nice is that I have, uh, uh, um, if you want, I have a direct, um, I mean, a nice interpretation of, of this uh, Brownian trajectory. I mean, this interpretation is already in, in, in Feynman's book, actually, yeah, in the Feynman and Hibbs book, um, where uh, you interpret this trajectory of the Brownian motion. You want to interpret it as 
the trajectory of a quantum particle in imaginary time. Okay. And uh, by the way, you can uh, easily show that, okay, this is just, uh, yeah. Okay. In particular, uh, you get, uh, if I look at a t equals zero uh, from A to B, uh, this is indeed the uh, delta A minus B. Good. So let's let's just check actually how and, and, and see how we can recover in fact the, the 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 standard propagator with this method because what you can do is just to expand uh, so if uh, you can compute this by expanding uh, the on the eigenvectors of h hat okay so you can just uh, these are just the plane waves. In case real. So you can just expand now this PT. From A to B. Well, let me just do that. So that will be just the integral for minus infinity. I have a continuum spectrum here. So DK of what? Of phi K of B. by k star of a exponential of uh, minus ek, but the energies here are just minus k squared by two, right? Times t. So these are just the, I didn't write them, but k squared by two is just the eigenvalues associated to, uh, to, this, to this guy. Okay, so this is just, again, I've just inserted uh, the, uh, eigenve the eigenvectors here uh, in, here and there, and I immediately get this this expression. So now, if I just uh, write, I mean, if I really insist on writing the explicit expression, uh, well, what you get uh, is just an integral for minus infinity dk over two pi of e i k times b by minus a minus k squared t, k squared by two times t. But this integral is a Gaussian, is a, Ga is a Gaussian integral that you can do easily. And what you get is the expected answer, of course. As it should. Right. So somehow we would like to find. So uh, uh, that's a nice way uh, to 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 compute the propagator. Uh, it's certainly not uh, the easiest one in this case, um, but it seems to work. So now what we would like to 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 uh, to, to have essentially is to, is to is to extend, if you want, this interpretation uh, to. Uh, the case of non-intersecting non-intersecting Ryan motions. Okay, so that's what uh, we want to do now, and So again, now I have this setup that we have already seen many times, but let me just repeat it. Uh, again, I have these trajectories. So we have time in that direction somewhere. Time tau, uh, this is time t here, time zero there. And I have this non-intersecting path. Okay, so I have the A's here and the B's there. 
And I want to find a way, a uh, quantum mechanical way to, 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 to incorporate this, this non-intersecting constraint. And the most natural way to do that is now to interpret these trajectories as the uh, trajectories of n fermions in imaginary time. Okay, so that's the, the generalization of what we have seen before. But the claim, what I claim is that um, I want to interpret them. Uh, so this is a quantum mechanics interpretation. Is that these non-intersecting these trajectories uh, are actually the trajectories of n non-interacting fermions. Non-interacting because we know that essentially they have no interaction, no true interaction, except that they do not cross. And we know that if they are fermions, then they cannot occupy the same state and uh, they should not be able to meet each other. Okay, so that, uh, that I want to say. So that will be the trajectories of n non-interacting fermions, of course, in imaginary time. Okay, so that gives us then a way uh, uh, to uh, physical way, if you want, uh, to compute to compute this propagator. So what it means, more precisely, is that as before, as we did here, right, exactly as we did here, we will have the gen generalization of this formula, but for fermions, free fermions, free in the sense that here. Uh, the, the, the Hamiltonian is it's just the Hamiltonian of free particles. So you think fermions because the weight should become zero when they intersect? Hmm? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's that that's that that that's the guess, or oh, that's the, the interpretation that we would like to give here. Yeah, exactly. And again, I will just write it uh, in this. Uh, so again, I will interpret. I, I didn't write it, but. You could write the path integral as I did here, and then interpret, I mean, do this interpretation formally. So here I directly arrive at that. That's what I'm writing now. But now the Hamiltonian is, is more complicated. I mean, slightly more complicated because where uh, h hat of n now is just the n body Hamiltonian. And the fact that we have fermions. So of course the fermions, the fermionic nature of the particles will enter into the way I will construct the single particle eigenfunctions. The, 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 sorry, the, the, the n-body uh, uh, eigenfunction. So in other words, what I'm saying is that this PT, so I will just expand this propagator here on the eigenvectors of these guys, this guy, but now, so I will just write it formally as a sum over E. It might be uh, a, discrete, uh, a discrete or continuum. Uh, in this case, of course, this will be continuum, but just for convenience, I just label the states in this way. Psi E of B, it's a bit formal what I'm writing here, but um, So this psi e are just the uh, okay. So that's an eigenvector of H n, but for fermions. Okay. So this is uh, really a n particle.
thermionic eigenstate. And because this is a fermion, you can actually write it as a slighter determinant. Okay, so we find uh, the, the slighter determinant that uh, Sanjib uh, was asking uh, a few minutes ago. Okay, so now of course, uh, what I want to get is, I would like to get the, 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 the formula of Carlin McGregor. Okay, I'm not still there, right? Because uh, I need to first expand this, and then I would like eventually really to find this quite elegant formula derived by Carlin and McGregor, which is, which is here. So I'm not still there, okay? I really want to show you that this method really works. So I want to really do the computation and convince you that this uh, fermionic approach uh, to non-intersecting path does really work, okay? So uh, what I want to say uh, is just that um, I can just write the, um, so how should I write this, this N particle uh, fermionic eigenstates? They are Slater determinant and they are constructed uh, so more, more, more precisely uh, psi E of x, and that will just be, uh, as we have seen now, we are familiar with fermions, that will be a one over square root of n uh, times uh, a determinant that I will construct from the single particle eigenstates, okay? So the single particle eigenstates, uh, I just, let me just write it this way. So this will be phi ki of xj, okay? And the energy, of course, E is just, so we have phi k of x is just a single particle wave function. And the E, which is here, is just the sum of E, which is actually a function of the K1, K2, Kn. Okay, so my state is labeled by these Ki's, and this is just the sum uh, from I equal one to N of Ki squared divided by two. So I have a fairly explicit expression, of course, now Right, because I will now, in so the sum over E here will be an integral, multiple integral over these quantum numbers, K1, K2, Kn. And this will be a product of two determinants. And then this exponential here is explicit because this is just given by that, okay? So I can actually write something explicit here. So let's let's have a look at it, how does, how does it look like? So the claim is that this PT from A to B is just one over factorial N, okay? This is just the square of, the, of these guys. And then I have this multiple integral. So I have an integral DK1 DKN of a product of two determinants. So I have determinant phi ki bj times the determinant of phi ki star of aj and times the exponential of the energy times time, okay? So this is just basically K1 squared minus K2 
2 squared, etc. Minus kn squared. So okay, just put factor here times t. Okay, so again, this is maybe it's not very cleanly written, but this is just exponential of minus et, where I have just used this expression for e. Okay, so this is nice, okay, but I have still a multiple integral to do, and uh, okay, it's not clear how to do that. And in order to find out the uh, this formula that Carlin and McGregor gave. Okay. So it turns out that there is a very nice formula which allows to do this, uh, this, this, this multiple integral. And this integral, I, I, I give you this result because it's a very nice formula, which is very useful in particular uh, in, in random matrices. Uh, this is called the Cauchy-Binet formula. So what is it about? Well, it allows precisely to integrate, to, 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 to compute these multiple integrals. So if I just uh, give you a set of function, fi of x, gi of x, for one to n, well, you can actually compute, there is a beautiful and simple formula for this double, so you want to compute this integral fi xj times gi of xj and eventually times a product of function w of xi. So there is a uh, wi of xi. So there is a third set of functions. So this is exactly of the of, of the form that we have, right? Uh, the fi xj are exactly our, our phi ki bj. This gi xj are our phi ki star aj. And this product here are just this product of this, uh, these exponentials, okay? Now it turns out that this is, you can just write it as a simple determinant. And this is just a determinant of the integral dx. No, sorry, actually, I, I'm, I'm a bit, I'm going a bit too fast. Sorry, there is no i here. This is just, okay, so in our case, we don't need that. that there is a specification when w is also depends on i, but so this is what? This is just this integral dx of fi of x, gj of x, w of x. Okay, so that's that's a quite nice formula. I mean, uh, the, usually the first time we saw it, it does not, I mean, okay, it's, there is one term which is missing here, so there is a factorial n here. So that's the Cauchy-Binet formula. And it's very useful actually in random matrices because we have seen that many times we have to deal with such products of determinants. And uh, actually it just gives back, can be written as a single determinant. So usually, I mean, to show this, this is relatively easy to show uh, if you really just expand uh, the determinant using the Laplace expansion uh, as product, uh, the sum over um, permutations. Uh, it's a bit long computation, but at the end, uh, it comes out relatively simply. So the nice thing is that now we can apply, uh, we can apply this formula, you see, uh, to our case. Okay, so if we apply to, uh, so if we apply it to, uh, to compute PT of AB. So basically what we will get, so let's do that. So we have a one over factorial n, which will be canceled by this guy. 
okay? And then this multiple integral, okay, this, these are ki years, these are xi there, but this is exactly the same. And what we get is just that this is a determinant. Determinant of what? So we have an integral over dk. In our case, this goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. Of what? Well, the function, uh, well, fi is just phi i star. So this is just uh, one over square root of two pi exponential of minus. So this is a determinant from ij. Okay, so this is just i k. Or oh, maybe the i index is not very nice. So let me just uh, change to because I have i the complex number. Let me just call it k and l if you don't mind. That's just so this will be uh, fk. So that will be exponential of minus i k of a sub index k, then one over square root of two pi of i k b l and then i will have this w function and this w function is just exponential of minus k square t by two okay so it's nice because now you can explicitly perform this uh this uh integral, but you easily recognize now that this is indeed uh, your propagator from AK to BL, right? And the final answer is that it's precisely uh, the determinant one to n of pt of ak to bl and this is exactly the carlin mcgregor formula all right so of course uh, what I wanted to show you here is that uh, this is a quite nice, um, so I mean, first physically, I mean, it's nice to, to have a physical interpretation, I mean, derivation of this formula in terms of fermions. Uh, now it turns out that uh, you can do much more in the sense that with these fermions, uh, there are, in principle, you can obtain actually very nice formulas that you would not obtain directly from the, from the Cauchy Binet. And this, this has been used actually in many papers. Uh, we have been used actually uh, this, uh, this, uh, these methods uh, quite a lot, and maybe I can just, so we started to work on that actually with, uh, with, 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 with some colleagues. Uh, the first, first paper that I can give you is this, uh, I'm just making from some publicity for our paper. Uh, it's quite, quite, uh, I think, instructive and well written. If you want to know more, this is a PRL, but, uh, then, so there is not so much. And this is PRL. This is the only ref that I give here. I mean, I'm sorry, I mean, it's not very fair, but uh, I, will, I will provide some more complete list of references actually for those of you who are interested. It's already 2008, but then we use this to compute uh, many other things and uh, eventually some uh, observables in the KPZ uh, context uh, using the connection that I briefly mentioned the other day. So uh, now what I want to, to, to show you is, uh, so we have seen this that these non-intersecting Brownian motions, you see that they are connected to, to fermions. Um, also, we have seen that fermions, in some way, there they they, 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 they are some relations to endometrisis. So I want to show you uh, uh, a clean connections uh, with, uh, with uh, randometric theory. So that will be, and that will drive us to the Dyson's Brownian motion. So that, that will be the, the last part of this. Um, so this one, so let me just check the numbering. This was 2, 1. Yeah, so this should be 2.2. And then I move to uh, another 
uh, let me just what was the first thing Kalin Mantego formula okay so now that what I want to discuss is uh, capital number two that will be watermelons and RMT. And that will drive us to Dyson's Brian motion. Okay. Excuse me. Right. So I really want to study this, uh, the case now where all the AIs and the BIs actually, uh, uh, all the AIs and BIs actually are similar. Wouldn't, okay, so yeah, I just maybe take this question by Tredib. Wouldn't the formula also come directly from diffusion equation in a vial chamber with absorbing? Yes, yeah, so that's indeed, uh, yeah, that, that's another way of, uh, uh, hi, Tredib. Yeah, so that, that's another way of formulating that, indeed. Um, I didn't have time to uh, to explain this, although I could have done it, but it's true that um, you can view the, uh, the, the Brownian motion of n particles as a single Brownian motion in n dimensions, and now you want to confine it uh, in a given region of the plane. Uh, so it's clear, I mean, for instance, if you just have two, two guys, X1 and 2, so this is in the, indeed called vial chamber. And as you, as you point out, you need the absorbing boundary condition. I mean, in the sense that uh, uh, if you want now to, 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 to solve the, uh, the Fokker-Planck equation, uh, you will need to impose some absorbing boundary condition on some hyperplane uh, of this n-dimensional space and uh, essentially in these vial chambers, along the lines of these vial chambers. And that's, that's indeed one way to see it, yeah. So yeah, Karin McGregor, essentially, that's the language they use, in fact. I mean, if they use that, that's the way probabilists would, would say it. Yes, definitely, yeah. So directly means, uh, yes, directly, uh, okay. As direct as Karin McGregor, I would say. That's, that, that's basically the, the, the same. Okay, thanks. Okay. Right, so, Again, uh, what I want, to, I would like to, to study is this sort of uh, peculiar uh, trajectories, uh, which I would have basically all the all my my Brownian motion now starts and end at the same point. So I would like to have something like that. So this is the watermelon configuration. Now there is a little bit of a problem uh, if you do if you want to do that. It's a technical one because. Brownian motion is 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 a quite irregular in the sense that you want to that at t equal zero you want all the position to coincide, but right after that at t equal zero plus uh, you want them to be disjoint. Okay, and this is not possible for Brownian motion. So that means that if they are at zero, if they coincide at t equal zero, then right after that they will cross each other many times, infinitely many times. In other words, the density of zero crossings is infinite, and uh, you need some regularization, okay? Uh, and so that's that's what I want to say. And the way to do that typically is that you will instead first uh, make them slightly far apart from each other and then takes some limit uh, going to zero. So basically that means that uh, you will find your first guy. It will start at epsilon one and it will arrive at epsilon one again. And then you will have the second guy. We start at epsilon two, arrive at epsilon two. So these are real bridges. They start and end at the same point. And then the last guy, epsilon n, again, will be the same. So you will compute this, this quantity here, and then uh, we will do, so is, maybe I should, uh, should indicate the time, the time axis somewhere. This is time t. 
And then at the end of the day, uh, we will take the limit uh, epsilon i goes to zero at the end. Okay, so we will compute whatever we want in this setting with these regulators. And at the end of the day, we will take the epsilon i goes, goes to zero. So now what I would like to, 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 I mean, the connection to RMT, there is a nice way to see it is just to, I mean, I want to, to, to compute I, I just want to, to look at my, my, my system, say at a given time t, or say a time tau. So I have a time slice, and I want to get the joint distribution of these guys x1, x2, xn. Okay? So how do I do that? Well, I will first compute it with these uh, epsilon i's, and then, so I want the joint probability to be at x1, x2, eventually xn. And at the end of the day, I will take the epsilon i goes to z. So how do I do that? Well, I want to use the Markov property of the whole process. So that means that the dynamics itself, if I look at the n Brownian motions at the same time, they constitute a Markov process. And I want to compute the probability to find them at time tau. Well, how will we do that? Well, that's simply the probability that they all start at epsilons, that they arrive at x1, x2, xn at time tau, and then they need to come back. I mean, that means the, this, on this part here, the transition probability again is the probability that starting from the xi's and arriving at epsilon i's at a given at a given time t. So I will just call my final time capital T. That's the final time, which is fixed. And I really want to, uh, which I will fix to one actually, I mean, just to, to otherwise the notations will be a bit, a bit heavy. So I fix the time interval uh, to be one. And this is time t equals zero here. Okay. And I really want to get this, uh, the, the joint probability. So let's see how it goes. So I have an explicit formula for that at a given time tau. So that's basically, again, I first propagate from, so this is, sorry, this is the propagator the transition probability p of tau uh, from epsilon to x. And then I want again to propagate from x to epsilon in a time one minus tau. Okay. And then, of course, because it's a probability, I need to normalize it, okay? So I want to compute, I need to normalize this. So that means that I need to uh, divide this guy by uh, the total, I mean, the probability, if you want, uh, that on the interval one, I go from epsilon to epsilon, okay? So now it's, this, this guy is normalized, this one. I, I, this is a joint probability, okay? So I really want to get the joint, uh, yeah, should define what it is in fact. Gregory. Yes. So I guess both the numerators and denominators independently go to zero as some powers of epsilon. Yeah, exactly. So that's the idea. So that's why at the end of the day, okay, I hope that the epsilon goes to zero limit is well defined. And indeed, uh, both the numerator and the, denom the denominator actually goes to zero when epsilon goes to zero. Uh, but this ratio turns out to have a nice limit. And this is really in this limit where the formulas somehow become a little bit nicer because of course, uh, this one is elegant, uh, but still, I mean, you see it's a determinant. I mean, the, 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 the inside of this, you have a Gaussian and you cannot evaluate explicitly this determinant for any. It turns out that in this limit, uh, things become simpler. And if you do that carefully, I mean, it's not extremely, uh, I mean, it, it requires some care. I will not do the details, but what you find 
uh, with what I showed you before, is that this is just up to some normalization, which depends both on n and tau. What you get is the product from i less than j of xi minus xj squared exponential of minus two sigma square of tau, so that, that's a non-trivial function of tau, times the sum from i equals one to n of the xi squared. Okay, and sigma square of tau, I, 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 I need to, be, to, to give it to you. Sigma square of tau is just the square root of two tau, one minus tau. Okay, so that's quite nice, right? Because if you look at this formula, well, uh, you recognize the formula that we have seen uh, from the first lecture, actually. Uh, this coincides with the, the joint probability density function of the eigenvalues of random matrices belonging to the Gaussian unitary ensemble, okay? So that says, indeed, that uh, basically what it says now is that if I look at, say, xi divided by sigma of tau, of course, there is a non-trivial time dependence, not completely trivial dependence. Then in density, or in low, if you want, uh, they actually behave as the eigenvalues of a GUE random matrices. Okay, so that's that's the sort of uh, the, the link now. And this is quite nice, I mean, because, um, I mean, this this allows at least to, I mean, if you just collect a little bit the things that, uh, if you start to assemble a little bit, some informations that that I gave you during this, this lecture, for instance, yesterday, um, I was just, um, one of the motivation uh, was this, this, uh, connection with the cardar paris zang equation, okay? So I told you, I will not show it, okay? I told you that the, if you look at the top path, and if you look at, uh, on a specific, uh, on a specific window in time and in space time, then you find the KPZ equation. So now you say, you see that, okay, if I look at what happens at a given tau here, well, I know that the position of these guys I know that they are distributed like the eigenvalues of random matrices. Now, if I look at the top guy, if I go to the center, for instance, close to here, if I look at the top guy, I know that this guy will be distributed like the, lar like the largest eigenvalue of random matrices. And in particular, we have seen that the, uh, the largest eigenvalue uh, of a random matrix is indeed distributed as uh, the so-called uh, Tracy Williams distribution, which turns out to appear also in the KPZ equation. Okay, so that gives you a hint as to why uh, there is a sort of, I mean, how this this uh, Tracy Widom distribution somehow appears uh, in this context. Once you have this in the, in the context of KPZ, once you have this, once you are happy with the, or once you buy the fact that uh, you have this connection with KPZ and random matrices, then you start to see to see this connection appear. Sorry. All right. So now I just want to uh, uh, end up uh, with the, 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 what is the, oh, yes. Uh, isn't it the sigma square? There is no root square root. Uh, yes, root thank sigma you. Square. Yes, yes, thank you. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, Gregory, I mean, uh, so uh, this formula was obtained by who first? Okay, I mean, uh, I think that uh, I haven't seen I haven't seen it uh, really before our work. To to be honest, I think that in, in the math, I mean, written explicitly like that before this paper that I mentioned, um, I think that uh, it it was probably I think several mathematicians probably had this in mind. And maybe it was already known. I don't know. I mean, in some way or the other, maybe less explicit. 
but at least this derivation that I showed you here, I mean, uh, this this was done by in our in our work basically. Okay, but I mean, like I. Uh, uh, I mean, this is uh, like, was there some intuition why you would expect this? I mean, like, uh, I mean, this, 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 this uh, RMT, you mean these connections? Like, yeah. No, I mean, uh, no, I mean, we, it just came. Is it okay? Yeah, it, it just, it, it, it just came. Okay. At, as a, uh, okay. There were, there were some other models where, uh, for instance, there were other models of non-intersecting paths, not really Brownian motions, but typically like the multi-layer uh, PNG model that uh, Spohn and others had studied, um, which is a kind of variant of that. They had already observed, no, that, I mean, that there was some random matrix uh, models here. I don't think that the intuition is, I mean, it's a bit, okay. There is this non-crossing properties and uh, you say, okay, this might be fermions. And if you have fermions, okay. Um, it might, might well be that uh, they would behave very similarly to a, uh, to random matrices, but I think the, the, there is no easy way to understand that. I mean, okay. beyond uh, this simple argument, the way it comes out, I mean, it's quite subtle actually. I mean, and uh, why this is exactly GOE that enters, I mean, which is at the end, the most popular model. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I don't think that there is a nice or simple, uh, simple way of doing that. Yeah, okay, thanks. Gregory, the connection no. that Okay. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, please. please. Uh, sorry, can I ask? Yeah. So yes, the sure. connection doesn't matter at which value of tau you look, right? So you yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. That, so that, 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 that holds actually, that's a good point that that holds for any tau and any n, right? So that, that's not a large n result. So yes, indeed. And the exponential measure that you get, it is the dupe conditioning as well, right? The, the fact that the, the bridge condition gives you an effective uh, yes. harmonic potential uh, confinement is the dupe uh, condition. Yeah, you can do it this way. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Gregory, do you, uh, with some other initial and final condition, can you also realize this uh, other initial condition of KPG? Like, uh... Uh, okay, so that's a good question. So, uh... <clears throat> Not in terms of non-intersecting path, actually. So it turns out that, um, okay, uh, for the, the GUE, basically, <clears throat> or say for the um, curved, curved space, let, let's talk about KPZ. Um, for the curved space, um, <clears throat> it is known that the, the fluctuations of the KPZ is governed by what is called the RE2 process. And this RE2 process is precisely the process that you get by zooming uh, uh, exactly as I said here, okay? So if you zoom here on this uh, window here, <clears throat> what you get is the RE2 process, which is indeed the one that, of KPZ. <clears throat> now, for, 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 for the flat case, for instance, you have, uh, there is another process uh, because it's associated to, to the GOE and beta equals one, so people call it the RE1 process. So there was this idea that uh, maybe the RE1 process uh, was uh, associated to the top, the, the, the top path of random matrices, but instead of taking GUE, you would, you would take GOE. But that turns out to be wrong. And uh, this is a null result. I mean, this has, this has been demonstrated by uh, Ferrari and, uh, and, and others and collaborators uh, that this, in this case, this is, it turns out that this is not, there is no, at least, natural uh, non-intersecting path model associated uh, to, 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 this, to this case. So the, the, the case of uh, different types of initial conditions is, is, is I mean, is, is not so nicely connected to, to this model. Yeah, that's also a bit of a coincidence. I mean, it seems that uh, the curved space uh, is very special. It's also because GOE is extremely special. So, so in a given interval, let's say t instead of one, if you just make it t. So if I, if I initial spacing between the initial points, if I make it square root of t, and final spacing also, if I make it square root of t, then what do I get? It's, it's something else, is it? Yes, you would get something else. I mean, you would get some kind of large deviation regime, uh, which would be then different. I don't think that people have studied that too much. Yeah, so here it's really a, a regime where I fixed I fixed the uh, the time to be one, 
and I take a large number of fermions or of fermions or of, uh, workers. Yeah. Um, yeah, so there is this question that probably I need to, to answer. Why was the epsilon goes to zero limit required? Should things not be independent of where you start and end from? Uh, well, I'm not sure I understand the question, but uh, what I want really to have uh, is this kind of, 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 okay, let's take again what I wanted to have. I really want to get this guy, okay? I want really to have all the points that start and end at the same point, okay? So, of course, I break the, 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 the this breaks the, the translational invariance, right? So, um, I, I, I need this epsilon uh, as a regulator, if you want, because I cannot, this, this is an ill-defined condition for the, uh, for the Brownian motion. In fact, you already know that. I'm sure that, for instance, if you, uh, if you look at the, the Brownian motion uh, condition to stay positive, um, well, if it starts at zero, then uh, it doesn't mean anything. I mean, the, the, you, 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 you always need to, uh, to, to, to regularize the, the trajectories of the Brownian motion in the sense that it cannot be zero at time t equals zero and zero plus at time zero and, and never cross the origin uh, after t equals zero plus. Okay, so that's uh, really due to the fact that if it crosses zero, it will recross it many times after 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 that after that time, that, that instant. So also, I guess independently, I guess the weight of that process is zero because of the non-crossing, right? If you just exactly, yeah. exactly, yeah. So that's why you need this 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 regularizations. If you want to study this, uh, it's because I, I I had to introduce this epsilon i's because I wanted to study this very specific condition. Yes, I hope this. Helps. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, hi, uh, one new question actually in the definition of your joint probability, okay. the denominator uh, strictly is zero, right? Uh, this propagator, what you are dividing by. So, uh, do you have to scale one of these variables uh, somehow to uh, before taking this epsilon zero limit? Okay, so, so uh, basically, what happens is so this guy, this guy is well defined. I mean, if epsilon is finite, this is well defined. Okay. Uh, uh, that uh, given by the uh, Carlin Negroer formula, uh, it, if I substitute uh, uh, it to be zero, they are same same coordinates, right? Uh, no, yeah, there, there will there, there will be epsilon one and b bar. One. Yeah, b bar is same as a bar. Yes. Okay, okay. I guess basically both okay. numerator and the denominator go to zero in same order of epsilon. Yeah, exactly. I mean that's that that's what you really need, right? Oh, indeed. Okay, okay. thanks. Because you see, uh, it will not, yeah, it will not be zero. Uh, the the Carlin McGregor uh, matrix, right? Because the even if if the epsilon, the A and B's, so A I and B I are the same. But uh, A I and oh yeah, yeah, only diagonal elements are identical. Exactly, only diagonal elements. Okay. I was thinking like connection to this fermions, uh, so I was thinking like. Uh, uh, I mean, there is no amplitude for all the fermions to be at the sort of same point. Uh, taking this no. epsilon going to zero, what does that mean? For no, me I mean, all? okay, yeah, okay. Uh, yes, yes, I guess probably, I, probably there, is, there is a connection, right? I mean, I think if you, I think it, if you terms, if you think so, three fermions, uh, you can you can think about it in terms of one plus one, so it's a one one dimensional quantum model, so it's a one plus one, it's a two D model effectively. So it probably has some meaning in terms of operators in the CFT, which is associated to that. But okay, I, I don't know very well these these things. But indeed, um, uh, the, the 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 fact is that uh, these guys will 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 cancel with some powers of the epsilon i's, uh, and uh, these guys too, and basically they combine in a nice way such that the ratio has a good, has a nice limit, which is not completely obvious for primary. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, hi, Gregory. I had a question. Yes, please. Yes. So, like uh, that uh, formula for PT probability distribution in terms of the determinant, I forgot the name. Uh, that's quite general, right? Yes, it's quite general for Markov processes. For Markov processes. Okay. So, uh, so I I was thinking like if you carry this uh, analysis for some other Markov process, then like do you get connections with some some other random metrics? Uh, not that I know, but uh, this has not been explored so much. 
people have mainly focused, I mean, this formula has been, uh, uh, I mean, yeah, pretty much. Oh, for example, for something like, say, uh, this uh, integral of Brownian motion. Yeah, but integral of Brownian motion is, is, not, is, is not Markov. No, but in, in uh, X and V, it becomes Markov, right? Yeah, okay, but then I don't know what it means. I mean, yes, yes. Uh, then you have to go to the XV plane, and uh, then I don't know what it means. In principle, yes, you're right. One should be able... Uh, this has not been uh, studied at all, as far as I know. Okay, okay. But first, we, 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 which, I mean, if you want to do that, you should think of what you want to compute first, <laughs> because uh, uh, it's not so evident. No, if I want to compute, say, joint distribution of x1, x2, xn. And the, and the, velocity, and the associated velocity. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, in, uh, I mean, we have to do that, but uh, later I can integrate these velocities. Yeah, okay, in principle, yes, maybe you can write some, some, some formulas, yes. Okay, this has not been done, but I agree, it would be very nice. Thank you. Okay, so maybe I can just uh, finish with that, I mean, because, in fact, uh, this... Uh, this allows, um, this shows that there is a nice connection, right, between this eigen, this, the uh, non-intersecting path and the, the eigenvalues of, of, uh, of random matrices. Now, there is actually a way, so that means that there is a way, if you want to uh, look at a, uh, a matrix, uh, a matrix Brownian motion, if you want, uh, and that's what I want to discuss here, in this context at least, uh, I just want to discuss uh, Dyson's Brownian motion in this case. So we have seen ma GUE matrices uh, during the, the first lectures and many, many times. Now I want to take, so the GUE matrix, uh, how, do you build, how do you build it? Well, in principle, you take a matrix H and this is an N by N uh, Hermitian matrix. And what we have seen is that typically you will fill this matrix with uh, random elements, say Gaussian elements, both real part and complex part. And then you will look at the, the, uh, the eigenvalues and you will get GU. So now I want to have a, a dynamical version of that. So I define H of T, which is now a matrix whose entries in fact depends on T. And the way they depend on T, and that's how Dyson's introduced his Dyson's Brownian motion, is that now the matrix elements themselves, they are performing Brownian motion, okay? So you take this, both the real part, so I define some elements. So BM, uh, they are Brownian bridges. And I need to have, so I have two families, B and B tilde. Okay, so there is a normalization factor. Don't worry too much about that. Then I have the diagonal parts, B of M, M. And then because it has to be Hermitian, uh, then I will just have that on the other side. So what are these guys, these B, these B, M, N, and B tilde? So basically the, the B, M, N, and B tilde, they are just uh, Brownian bridges. So here bridges, uh, meaning that they start and end at zero. Okay, so that defines that defines a matrix. So essentially, uh, the idea of Dyson's mind of, of Dyson's was uh, to take uh, a matrix, either a Gaussian orthogonal here, it's it's Hermitian, um, and now the matrix elements are themselves dynamically evolving, and you would like to look at the dynamics of the eigenvalues of this matrix. Okay, and this is what is called Dyson's Brownian motion. Now, 
what this connection here indicates, and you can show it more precisely, but what this connection indicates is that if you look at the, the dynamics of, uh, of lambda 1, lambda 2, So let me order them. It is called actually uh, the Dyson's Manion motion. Now, what is nice uh, is that what you can show, and okay, we have already seen what happens here at a given time t, but it turns out that the, the full dynamics of these eigenvalues is exactly the same as non-intersecting Brownian motion in the Watermelon configuration. As the one of vicious walkers. in what are Melon's configurations. So that's gives, that gives you actually a very nice way to simulate these guys. So you can really, now you now, you now have a very nice way of simulating such uh, trajectories where they should start and end at the same point. You just fill up this matrix here and you perform, I mean, it's, it's then quite, quite easy, right? And you just, construct these Brownian bridges and you look at the eigenvalues and if you look at the dynamics of the lambda i's, which is the which is called the Dyson's Brownian motion in this case, well this coincides actually with this non-intersecting uh, non-intersecting one of walkers. Okay. So that's sort of uh, okay so we arrived at this Dyson's Brownian motion that we have seen. So again uh, we have seen that somehow that the this this random matrix models have been a kind of unifying context co concept. Uh, during all these all, all these uh, all these lectures, and um, I try to show you various various models which uh, are connected to it. Uh, essentially, the fermions and this non-intersecting path, which, by the way, uh, themselves are connected. Um, but it's it's kind of whole um, whole families of of models actually that have uh, attracted a lot of interest, and in particular in this Cardar Paris design uh, around this this KPZ universality class. Um, this was, of course, here only an introduction to the subject, um, and there would be uh, much more to say about it. Uh, but I hope this at least uh, gave you a kind of overview of uh, uh, the models and ideas uh, that uh, that are around these uh, these uh, these problems. And I guess that uh, with that, I will uh, will stop here. And thank you. Yeah, thank you, Gregory. Yeah, okay. uh, you've given a very, I guess. Uh, I introduced many subjects and give a very good overview to the subjects. And uh, I guess uh, I really urge the student to actually go through the lectures. Maybe many of these uh, concepts you have probably seen it for the first time and it might appear difficult, but you should actually go through the lectures. And uh, also Gregory has uh, with other, his collaborators, they have written review article and uh, uh, yeah, all these things will be there. And uh, I think this is a very nice and inter interesting subject. and. I think it's okay. Yeah, okay. Glad that you actually could give these lectures. And uh, I think if there is any question now, maybe we can just take a question. Uh, hi. So this uh, epsilon zero thing, which I, uh, am I audible, right? I'm audible. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so this epsilon zero I meant uh, was, uh, I mean, all these epsilon i's could be some some x, x naught, say, right? That's, then it would be, won't be a problem, right? I mean, Zero yeah, seems yeah. to be a special. Uh, okay. Yeah, no, no, and, that's true. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. Yeah, of course, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, zero is not. Yeah, yeah, sure, 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 absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, the whole thing is invariant. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Yeah, I took zero just by. Uh, yeah, you're right. Okay, I, I see. Yeah, yeah. This could be any point here. And I mean, okay, I, I insist on having the, the the same points here. My my drawing is a bit misleading, but of course I could start every any at any point along the line. Yeah, of course. And uh, one one other thing is this Carlin um, uh, Mac. McGregor, right? This this formula is uh, this 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 thing is uh, I mean works for 
any kind of underlying dynamics right even if this is not brownian yeah again i mean okay you have the process has to be markovian uh, there are also some uh, some subtilities uh sub subtilities if you if you look at the way i, I sort of try to derive it um I, 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 you, you see that in, in, in the argument, at least in the argument, uh, you have seen that uh, what it was important to be able to identify a point where the two particles were crossing. Right. Now, if you take a random walk, for instance, in discrete time, uh, mm -hmm. it might be that uh, the, 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 um, the, the walks actually might cross each other, but without sitting exactly at the same point. Okay, so what, I, what I'm saying is that if you really have a random walk, for instance, uh, you could have a situation where, so these are the discrete steps, right? So the one will do, will do this and the other one will do that. Right. Okay. And this might create some problem. <laughs> okay, because this point there, well, you see that that means that the particle, I mean, they crossed each other, but ne that they never really sat on the same site exactly, okay? Of course, for Brownian motion, it's, it, this works because, okay, the, 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 the process is continuous. But uh, for, for random walks, for instance, it works, for instance, for plus minus random walk because of plus minus random walk, standard random walk. Uh, if two particles want to cross, they really need to sit at the same site at some point. Okay. Okay. So you, you, you have a little bit of, I mean, that there were some subtilities in, in the application of this of, of this formula, uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, it's still apl applicable in many in many in many instances. And the main the main ingredient is that it has to be Markovian. Indeed, that that's the main prescription. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Have people studied for OU processes like? The uh yes actually yes you can actually study it for who processes uh you can study it but there is not okay yes you, you you can study it actually yeah so we have actually looked at it a little bit so in fact um <clears throat> you can do that because the um, you see the when you look for the whole process is a bit is a bit particular because um you can actually transform the Brownian motion to the to the Einstein-Uhlenbeck process by doing this uh, Lamperti transformation. So basically, you, you go from uh, uh, time to logarithmic time, oh, yeah. and you transform the the, the 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 Brownian motion to Einstein-Uhlenbeck. And so you can use this this duality to uh, to to make it work. But otherwise, it's 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 uh, I think otherwise it's a bit complicated. I mean, only for the. Uh, uh, for, I mean, for a generic process in a in a generic potential, I mean, it has not been studied so much. Uh, I cannot use this formula. But you can use it, but the problem is that if you don't have a nice knowledge of the propagator, then then it's a bit it's a bit of a pity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What I mean is that at the end there are not so many processes for which you really know or have a nice expression for this for this guy, right? So. Uh, hi. Uh, so, uh, if I'm interested in like uh, looking at some this uh, distribution of some eigenvalues of some matrix, uh, and then I want to go, uh, I want to change the nature of them. Let's say I'm going from like some independently distributed ones to like I want to go to this uh, level repulsion kind of statistics. So, uh, can I think of like something as a, 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 a this dynamical parameter time so that like uh, when I put it in the Hamiltonian, uh, I can I can do this uh, to go from one kind of statistics to other statistics. Are there anything like this which is explored? Not that I know, but uh, in principle, yes. In principle, this this could be this could be this this should be doable. I don't know any concrete example where this has been worked out though. Maybe if, maybe you have ideas. If you have. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. Uh, so uh, another question is, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so uh, what about uh, this? Are there any uh, extensions of this uh, Dyson's Brownian motion to Genui like uh, uh, structures? Uh, to which structure? Sorry. Uh, uh, Ginbray ensembles. Uh, Ginibra ensembles. 
Yeah. Uh, okay, this is, I think, okay, the, 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 not that I know. I mean, one of the reasons is that, uh, I mean, of course, the non-crossing property in 2D, so uh, this uh, Geneva matrices, I mean, the, the, the spectrum lies on the, on the complex plane. And um, so then you, as time evolves, uh, you start to generate um, you start to generate some uh, trajectories in the plane, and okay, non-crossing traject these non-crossing trajectories. I think, as far as I know, I mean, as I, they, they have not been studied really. Uh, it's probably much harder to study, I guess. Yeah, I was uh, trying to allude to like there was old paper by uh, I think Lakshmanan and Nakamura where they are showing that. Uh, some spectrum of some Hamiltonian CPU sort of vary some uh, uh, parameter in the Hamiltonian. Okay. Uh, they show that the dynamics is displayed by some classical integrable uh, uh, system or some collegial Moser-like system. So I was thinking something like that kind of things okay. exist. Yeah, no, I, I don't know any uh, any anything concrete in that direction. But the, the, the okay. case of, the, the, of Geneva is interesting, but I, I think to, to a large extent it's open. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, let me take also this opportunity to thank you guys, uh, Sanjib and uh, and Avishek, for this uh, for the organization of this of this of this school in this uh, hard period. I think yeah, it's important. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks again for uh, this thing and giving this lectures. And okay, I hopefully we'll see you next year somewhere. But <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay, let's thank Gregory again. Maybe it's, okay, virtually thank Gregory and. Okay, yeah. thanks a lot, Greg. <laughs>